Well, it's exciting to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? What a great morning, fantastic music, singing this morning and following that up with testimonies. Uh, what a joy, what a, what a real blessing uh, it truly is. And it's exciting to uh, be able to get into God's Word. If you have need of a Bible this morning, these two fine gentlemen, uh, gentlemen in the back as well, be uh, willing to put one in your hand. If you slip up yours, you need a Bible. So please uh, do that if you need one. First Thessalonians chapter 4 is where our text will be this morning. <clears throat> Let me just give you a word of encouragement this past week. If you had uh, taken, how many of you picked up truelife.org cards last week? Just slip up your hand. You picked up cards last week. Okay, many, many of you did. You may still have some of those in your pocket. Uh, I had every opportunity uh, there this week. I gave out some earlier in the week. And then later on in the week, I had two blown opportunities. I had two opportunities, and the one time I, I had it, and I was going to give the fellow the card, and I, I just totally slipped my mind. And the next time I thought, I, I was at my dentist getting my crown put on, and I thought, what an opportunity. And he and I got talking, and he's telling me about stuff. We actually have a lot of stuff in common, and, and I thought, Lord, thank you. This is a perfect opportunity. But, but every time he put the crown on, he'd push it down, <laughs> and I came off of the chair. And he said, now we'll have to adjust this a couple times. Well, at the sixth time of having this pulled off, and it was on so tight, when he pulled it off, I thought, this tooth is coming out. You know, all this for nothing. It's just going to come out. It's going to be in his hand. And I'm thinking, what is my reaction going to be? What's his reaction going to be when he goes pop and the whole thing comes out? It's amazing how your mind works. And, <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, I thought, wow. You know, and then I'm thinking, I've got to get, and, and I like to take the card out of my wallet, have it in my hand so I don't forget. And I'm laying there in the chair and I'm thinking, I can't really reach back there and take my wallet out. He's doing all this stuff and he's terrorizing my route. And, and, and so, so when we're all done, he says, okay, you're all set. You can go. <laughs> I went out of there like Mach 5. <laughs> totally forgot to give him a card. <laughs> However, something tells me I'll be back. We are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Don't be discouraged. Make it part of your life to give the uh, cards out and start the conversation with people. You will be blessed by doing it. You really, really will. So, But just don't get discouraged. I get frustrated with myself. We're just not perfect uh, at it yet. And uh, we also have to remember the adversary doesn't want us to hand out uh, any type of the elements of the gospel. And so we're up against that as well. So we're not going to quit. We're not going to give up. We're just going to kind of just keep on rolling with it and encourage each other. All right. We are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 this morning in verse 1. The apostle Paul finally gets around to being able to address the topics that had come back to him from Timothy who had visited these people. Timothy, if you recall, was sent back to do discipleship. And when he comes to the Apostle Paul, he tells them about their love and their faith to the Lord Jesus. It is a time of encouragement. However, there were certain things that Timothy must have noted to Paul. And he must have expressed that these were needy areas. And so Paul writes here in 1 Thessalonians, and the first three chapters are all about saying, you know, how much I love you guys, and I'm so thrilled that you're showing the love of Christ, and your faith is abounding, and the gospel's going forward. There's all these fantastic things happening. And then we boil it down to chapter 4. And this is where God gets specific with the Thessalonican Christians. And there were certain things that the apostle wanted to convey to them. Verse 1 says, finally then, brethren. We're getting to that teaching part. He says, we urge and exhort you in the Lord. The words urge and exhort, all you need to know are those strong words. Yes, they are. These are very, very emotionally charged words. I am imploring you guys to listen. That you should abound is the goal more and more. You see, you're not done yet. He says you need to keep growing in your faith. And he says, just as you receive from us, and I like this next word, how. How you ought to walk and please God. You remember we talked about what discipleship was all about. That was over there in chapter 2 in verse 12. That you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And now when we get to chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is saying, I want to talk to you 
about how to go about walking the walk or living the life that is pleasing to God. And so this morning, let's ask the Lord to bless as we go into the Word of God and seek the answer to that question today. Father, we thank you for your Word is so precious. We thank you for the fact that we can come. We can just open it up and read it. And you've given to us, Lord, exactly the same things that were so necessary for the Thessalonican believers. Father, it's our desire today to know how we can please you, how we can walk the walk that, that you're speaking of here. Lord, we want to order our footsteps after your will. We want to follow after our Savior Jesus. We want to be men and women who demonstrate Christian maturity. Help us, Lord, today as we embrace this topic, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Here in this passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul goes on and he says that we ought to walk and, or know how to walk and to please God. How many of you here today want to please God? It's your true desire to be pleasing to God. Okay. So we're all together on this. We're all on the same page. That's our desire. And the Apostle Paul is going to get right down to the nitty-gritty with the Thessalonican Christians. And he does this here in verse 3 when he says, For this is the will of God. What is the will of God? He says, This is the will of God. In fact, it's something that we know very, very well. It is sanctification. That's what he says here in verse 3. For this is the will of God. It's the will of God for me to be able to be sanctified. The definition of sanctification is behind me there on the screen. In its verbal form, sanctify literally means to set apart. For a special use, a special purpose, God says what I want my people to be is set apart for me. In other words, I want them to be holy to me. I want them to be reserved for me. This is what is pleasing to God. This is what God's will is. If you want to know what God's will for your life is today, I can tell you most assuredly that God's will for your life is for you to be set apart to him. That's the most important thing in your life. As we notice sanctification and as we understand it, we also understand that there's a whole lot of barriers. There are things that will keep me There are things that will keep you from being set apart to God. And we know that that's true. The Christian walk is not an easy walk. We know that it is our ultimate goal to be pleasing to the Lord, but we know that there's pitfalls. We know that there's stumbling blocks along the way. Are you with me? Do you experience those too? Well, for the Thessalonican Christians, the Apostle Paul is all about them abounding more and more in their Christian life. And knowing how they can please God was absolutely essential for them. In fact, in their day and age, it wasn't easy. I could term this message, and the title is, Abstinence Makes the Heart Grow Fonder for God. Maybe you noticed on the sign out front our topic today. Might have grabbed somebody's attention. It said sex in the city. Sex in the city. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about. Sex in Thessalonica. You see, the issue here as we come to this passage of Scripture, notice with me there in verse 3, for the will of of our God is for us to be set aside for him. And here are three that's. This is how you're going to do this. He said that you should abstain he says, from sexual immorality. Abstain from sexual immorality. The church at Thessalonica was a church that was born out of a culture that was far, far away from God. They did not know what chastity was. They did not understand it as a virtue whatsoever. We exist today in our society, actually on the other side of this, we're actually sliding backwards into immorality. They were coming out of immorality. We find ourselves probably at about the same place, living in a world that's greatly afflicted by sexual immorality. 
I find it fascinating that when Paul starts to talk about sanctification and, and my faith growing and being come, be, becoming more and more set apart to God, uh, that there were, there, were, there were barriers. And the first place he goes is sexual immorality. I like what a fellow by the name of John Murray said. He said, indeed, the more sanctified the person is, the more conformed he is to the image of his Savior. The more he must recoil against every lack of conformity to the holiness of God. The deeper his apprehension of the majesty of God, the greater the intensity of his love to God. The more persistent his yearning for the attainment of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The more conscious he will be of the gravity of the sin that remains, and the more poignant will be his destitution of it. Was this not the effect in all of the people of God as they came into closer proximity to the revelation of God's holiness? I want to challenge you tonight. I want to challenge you today because we think of our society, and we think of our society in the terms of our society is becoming farther and farther away from the moral standard of God's word, and we can become, see if you agree with this statement, we can become more desensitized all the time. But here's what the scriptures say. The scriptures, and John Murray agrees, is that the reality is if our sanctification is truly taking place, that is we are growing in our holiness, our growing in our, our understanding of the majesty of God's holiness, if we're understanding that more, actually sin becomes more offensive. So if you're here today and the sin is all around you and you're becoming more and more desensitized to it, that is not the place you want to find yourself. In fact, you want to find yourself in a place where you are more and more agitated over the sinful situation we find ourselves in. Because the more closely you align with God, the more you detest the sin in society. You see, that's the issue. We want to understand how to please God. We're going to please God through personal holiness. Paul comes to these Thessalonican Christians, and it was a mess. I mean, it, their society was, was just really in disarray. I mean, it was, it was so, so bad. So when Paul says that you should abstain from sexual immorality, understand that these people didn't know anything about what, what true morality was. The Gentiles, as you may recall, in Paul's writings, Paul singled them out. And he would say things like, you know, boy, these Gentiles, they're really immoral. And, and you know, the, the church should never sin a sin like that. I mean, that sin is so bad, it's not even named among the Gentiles. Do you get my drift? Among the Jews, there was a higher understanding of morality. But one of the things that stands out about the church at Thessalonica, and it's not so much the church, but the society at Thessalonica, there's never been a time where, prior to this, that marriage was more disregarded and degraded than this time period. Among the Gentiles, you, you basically mark the time periods of your life by who your spouse was. You had so many. And if you were a Jew, you had to understand the Jews had a, a higher regard for marriage. In fact, they would say that it was, was, was so bad. I mean, if a Jew would say, I'd rather die than commit idolatry, murder, or adultery. So it sounds good, right? I mean, it sounds like, hey, marriage is way up here. The problem was, if you go back to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, God says that a man could divorce his wife for uncleanness or some shameful acts, and so they were real quick to start to figure out, well, what does that look like? And you know how that goes among the Jewish leaders. So some of the more devout Jewish leaders, the, the more orthodox conservative ones said, you could only divorce your wife if she had committed adultery. Now, there wasn't anything written about the guy doing it. I understand. We'll, we'll get to that down the road here as more revelation comes from God. But here's what they did. The more liberal ones, and this is, this is by and far 99% of the Jews at this time. Remember, Paul goes to the synagogue at Th in Thessalonica, and he begins teaching there. Among those Jewish leaders, here's what their take was. Uncleanness or bringing shame could amount to a woman cooking dinner for her husband and putting too much salt on the food. Literally, you could divorce for that. 
And it was commonplace for that to happen. And so you had so many wives, you'd, you'd ditch one, get another one, you know, get the new model. And, and you know, you just kind of whoop, whoop. And if, if, she was, uh, if she was so negligent as to go out into the marketplace without a hair covering, a head covering, get another wife. You know, I mean, this was great. And, and, and so if she was a brawling woman, they said, oh, my wife's a brawling woman. Well, that, okay, you can get rid of her, get a new wife. Uh, what, what does brawling mean? Well, brawling was defined as if she, uh, you could hear her voice in the next house over, she was considered to be a brawling woman, you know? And, and the only reason the wife had to, had to raise her voice in the first place is because the husband wouldn't say, you know, respond. You ever do that? <laughs> wife's talking to you, you're like, mm-hmm. Hey, Kev! <laughs> Up, brawling woman. <laughs> you see, the problem was, was that they did not regard marriage in a, in a high esteem at all. So when Paul comes to this point, he, he singles it out and he says that, that, here's the first of three that's, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. The word there for this immorality is the word where we get pornography from, pornel. So this was the first problem. The problem of that day was that sin was rampant. They had prostitution that was associated with their quote-unquote worship. It had fully integrated into every aspect of their life. And what God's word is saying is when it comes to the sexual immorality, it is a barrier to your sanctification. You will not be holy as I am holy as God has commanded us if we are as well practicing sexual immorality you say well pastor kevin i i I don't know Uh, listen our society is totally over the top with regard to sexual immorality you cannot even watch tv commercials today without being bombarded by ungodliness it's just the way it is right and and i find that i have to tape everything so that i can go through the commercials because i'm not interested In, in fact my favorite tv show i have to confess my favorite tv show is actually cheyenne They started making it in 1955. (laughs) And they ran it for seven years through 1962. And I just think that's the best show on TV. This guy is morally sound. I mean, he is morally sound. And he is wicked fast with a six gun. (laughs) I think he's cool. He's like my hero. The rest of this stuff, we're just wading into this, this moral decay. And what Paul looks at the Christians there in Thessalonica, he says, what what needs to set you apart from your society is actually your stand on morality. And that is precisely what is is setting us apart. Do you realize that? Uh, We're anti-abortion as the church. We're anti-abortion. Why? Because we know that life begins at conception. We, We believe in the sanctity of life. But all these things are actually part and parcel to A very immoral society that wants nothing more than to be able to sin without impunity. I mean, this is what we're looking at in our society today. In fact, it's gotten so bad. We we look at some of the situations uh, in some of these statistics. And if you go online, you can find people like uh, the Christian uh, statistic guy, like George Barna. And he's got lots of statistics. He talks about every second. People are on uh, online uh, looking at things that are inappropriate. Internet users viewing pornography every second. There's, you know, on and on and on. Every 39 minutes, a new pornographic movie or some whatever they call it is made in this country. Now, that's pretty appalling, isn't it? I mean, when you get to the book of Revelation, you realize that, the tr- that Babylon has fallen. And part of Babylon's whole sin city aspect is that it's contributed to the decay of the world. It makes you wonder. One in five mobile searches are used for, per, for pornography. 24%, 24% of smartphone owners admit to having pornographic material on their mobile handset. Wow. 64% of Christian men, 15% of Christian women say that they view this type of inappropriate material once a month. Here are some of the views. These are views on, on Christian ethics. Christian sexual ethics teach that 
sex should be within a marriage between a man and a woman. Which of these following words best describe your opinion of those ethics? And you could see moral was the, the choice here. And as it goes down from elders to boomers to Gen Xers to millennials, uh, there's not too many millennials that are actually thinking that moral as a term to describe traditional marriage as given in the scriptures is actually apropos. It tells us that things are sliding that way. We see so much in our culture. I was uh, mentioning in the first service about uh, a fellow who came to me after he moved from Florida to Duxbury, Massachusetts. He came to me and we were talking. We became friends. We'd get out for coffee uh, once every couple weeks and we would talk and he would tell me that upon moving to the town uh, that people had approached he and his wife about being in an open relationship, a polyamorous relationship. Polyamory is something that Al Mohler has written on. It's a wide open sexual type of relationship where you have clusters or family families they call them uh, that basically have people who are consenting to uh, sexual relations uh, across the board and it's fine with the wife it's fine with the husband and it's not polygamy because there's no marriage involved uh, they actually define their movement in terms of the moral principle of ethical non-monogamy can you imagine that it's defined as engaging in loving intimate relationships with more than one person. So as long as you love this other person, you know, everything's good. And they get family units, like four or five married couples can become a part of that. It's growing so fast that as researchers are just beginning to do, to do study in this phenomenon, uh, they are estimating uh, that there's more than a half a million people right now in our country who are engaging in these types of relationships. In fact, there's a cluster in every single major city in the country. Wow. But it's not just these. When you, when you look up here and, and you realize that this problem is, is actually extending to the church, instantly, by, by the way, <laughs> this elders here, uh, we are seeing all types of, of sin uh, and sexual immorality, even among people who are older. This isn't just the young people. You remember when it was just the young people? That's because you were young and you were part of the sexual revolution. You see, back in the 60s. But places like the villages in Florida have a higher STD rate uh, than the rest of people in their 20s. And I have a pastor friend who's a lead teaching pastor down in Tampa, and he was telling me that. I looked it up, and sure enough, it's true. One doctor uh, who was there visiting his grandmother's friend, helping uh, her with some problems, said that it's like spring break continually down there. Sexual immorality. You see, it's a, it's a huge problem. 93% of pastors believe that pornography is a growing problem in their church. The other 7% didn't understand the question. <laughs> Paul understood. God understands. And God's looking at this, and God is saying, wait a minute, there's, there's, a, there's a problem with this. This is, a, this is a huge, huge issue. Notice here the second that. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Now, this is important because when we think of sanctification, we've already determined the definition of that, but honor is to use the body uh, as a sacred instrument devoted to God's service. That's what it means to honor, and this is to give true honor. And so for these, he says here, that if you possess your own vessel in sanctification and honor, you will do that not like the world in passions of lust. You see, this is part of understanding who we are and, and how we can live a life that's, that's, that's righteous before the Lord. I find it interesting. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion as to what does this mean when it says to possess his own vessel. There are those who would say that the word possess means to acquire, and vessel could be a, a word that pertains to a person's wife. Go out and, and you know, and marry a woman. But I think here that what he is talking about doesn't really fit that definition. That rather we should understand, if you go back to ancient papyri and you look at some of the ancient uses, when you think of the, the word uh, to possess, uh, it's a common word. And I think that uh, Moulton and Milligan, Greek scholars, have it down when they say it's, it's speaking here of gradually obtaining the complete mastery over your body. Because we know that the word vessel, uh, Paul uses it other places. God has put his treasure in earthen vessels. 
And the key here is to be able to learn as Christians to be disciplined, to be able to master our own bodies. And use our bodies then for sanctification that is to be set apart to God with honor. That's the goal. As Paul looked at these believers, he said, you know, this is really going to set you guys apart. (laughs) You're going to be so different from the world around you if all you do is hold to a higher moral standard that the scriptures have set forth. How important it truly is truly is you'll notice there in verse five uh, that he says that there's a comparison for the person who possesses or masters his own life or his own body with sanctification and honor he says not and he he contrasts this here not in passion of lust like the gentiles who do not know god You see, for us as Christians, it's very important that we understand uh, that Paul is writing to us as followers of Christ. We have received the Holy Spirit of God. That's going to set us apart. Paul isn't looking at the world. This isn't moral majority where he's saying, listen, we've got to legislate morality. That's never going to work. He's not looking at the world. He's not looking at people outside the church and saying, listen, uh, they're going to have to conform. He says, listen, they're just full in their unbridled desires, and they are going the way of their flesh. Why, he says, because they don't know God. But for you and I, we're to be different. We're called to a higher standard. If all of these pastors believe there's a problem, what are they doing? There's actually a, a conference, a global conference here um, coming up next month. The church is going to talk about it. Leaders are going to get together. They're going to have a plan. One thing that you can do is if you uh, are, are struggling or even think you might struggle, here's a, a way to, to put a filter on your computer. It's called Covenant Eyes. It's a good website to go on. You should go on that. It tells you all kinds of statistics as well that support uh, the things that uh, I'm talking about here. How important it truly is. You see, for us as Christians, we're supposed to be set aside to God in holiness. That's the key. And here's the issue. If you think back to the Garden of Eden, Garden of Eden, do you know what the word Eden means? Does anybody know? It means delight, the Garden of Delight. And this was the place you wanted to live. I mean, this is the place. This is the zip code, folks. You want to live in the Garden of Delight. I mean, stop and think about it. There's Adam and Eve, and they're fellowshipping with God every single day. Isn't that fantastic? That is just fantastic. But they're naked as can be. I mean, naked. And and Adam doesn't walk over and look at Eve and say, listen, Eve, you need to get some clothes on. And she doesn't look at Adam and say, listen, Adam, you need to put some clothes on. They were absolutely innocent of anything. And God created them in a very beautiful way. Do you realize that we are created in the image of God himself? That's what the scriptures say. Our emotion, our intellect, and our will are all going back to our creator. God put in man's heart and woman's heart a physical desire for each other. That must have been cool in the garden. You got the perfect man, the perfect woman. They're naked all the time. And there's no difficulties, no pressures, there's no problems. There's no issues. Nobody's ever mad at anybody. We just love each other, love, 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 love all the time. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? That's how God made us. That's how God created us. And when man fell into sin, it changed everything. One of the first things that man realizes is, hey, honey, put something on. We're going to see God here soon, you know? Whew. Get some of these, these fig leaves might work right? See, things began to change, and they changed immediately. All of a sudden, man's mind was, was enlightened as it never had been before, and not in a good way, my friends, not in a good way at all. But here's the thing, as man progressed, man had to deal with the same desires that he had back before the fall. Woman, woman had the same desires before the fall. 
But now things become really complicated. Before the fall, we didn't worry if, if Eve gets pregnant because there's no issues with childbearing. And God said, be fruitful and multiply the earth. And so kids, 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 and more kids, that's great. But now all of a sudden there's issues with childbirth and there's issues where I have to go to work and there's pressures and I do things that infuriate you and you do things that make you upset and things become complicated. And so these in verse 5 who didn't know God satisfy their urges and their desires however they seek in whatever way they seek it. It's all about doing whatever and this was what was happening in Thessalonica and we, my friends, are getting closer and closer to that as well. Now God who is all wise knows that we have this issue. He knows exactly how he's created you. He knows exactly how he's created me. And he says, listen Kevin, you're gonna have desires in the area of sex and what I have done is I have worked it out for you. I love God, don't you? I mean, it is, it is so awesome. I mean, I, there was a time in my life I didn't know God. I, I, remember, I remember in kindergarten, I was just a dreadful sinner. I was saved when I was, how old, how old was I? Seven years old, right? And I was in kindergarten, and I'll tell you what, I just, yeah, I mean, I was a pagan. And I remember this girl named Helen, and I just, I, just fell in love with her. I was there in kindergarten and asked her if she would uh, kiss me, you know, and fortunately two years later I got saved and uh, I didn't hold hands again until I got to college. <laughs> but what God did was so phenomenal. If, if you had the time, you can go back and look it up, but Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says that marriage is honorable among all and the bed is undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, the Bible says God will judge. So what God did to, to solve the problem was to institute marriage. One man, one woman could satisfy their desires and they could enjoy one another as God had intended. Oh yes, there would be consequences in childbirth, that is true. But within the marriage boundary, there could be love in the expression of all those things which were good. But man has sought to be immoral. These who are followers of Jesus, who seek to be set apart for God, need to be able to satisfy themselves within the parameter of marriage in order to continue on that track of being set apart or sanctified, made holy unto God. He even goes so far as to say in verse 6 that no one, and this is the third that, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. Defraud means to literally cross over the line. It sometimes was translated transgress, to go beyond. And here it was the idea of cheating with the idea uh, of gaining at the expense of another, to take advantage, to have uh, this that is self-seeking uh, taken care of in our life. And God says here that we need to be very careful not to do this because he says the Lord is the avenger of all. He's talking here about spiritual vengeance, God bringing vengeance. He says, as we also forewarned you and testified. This is something that Paul had instructed them on even briefly. One of the first things that became relative to their success in walking the Christian walk was to live a life of morality, high standards. This is what God demands. And God says, you should never defraud one another. I'm not sure the exact context. I think just happen to think that Timothy brought back maybe some, some things that were very important. Sure, I think of David in the Old Testament who, who defrauded uh, Uriah with Bathsheba. I think of young people even today who think to themselves, well, you know, sex outside of marriage is fine, and it's not fine, and living together is not fine. It comes under that whole umbrella of fornication. And the Bible says that God, I've warned you, Paul says, God is the avenger of this. In fact, he actually takes it a step further. He says, because the Lord is the avenger. And he uses the terminology here as a reference to Jesus. He says, listen, Jesus will avenge this. 
Now, as I studied that and I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking about this, this tension here in this text. I was listening to Christian radio this week and I, I came across that song, uh, Grace Wins. Ever heard that, Grace Wins? You probably have heard it a number of times, but it's all about, you know, here's the trump card. At the end of the day, Grace Wins. And it's absolutely true. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? How then do you reconcile this verse of Scripture with the fact that there is therefore now no condemnation? You see, what is God avenging? Is it futuristic? Is it talking about something to do with my eternity? And it's really not. When I'm face to face with Jesus, I will be absolutely forgiven completely. I've already forgiven, and God will say, listen, it's all under the blood of Jesus. But understand this. How you live, which you can go all the way back here to the first verse in our text. Paul said, I want to give you how you ought to walk in order to please God, he tells me that if I step out of the boundaries that God has set up, that I will stand to be judged by God. That is, the way of the transgressor is hard. Things will impact me now. There will be things that I will face in this life before I get to that point where God says, all good. You see, we can live with the consequences of that sin if we choose to, but we don't have to choose to. We can notice here in this passage of scripture, the Bible says, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but he called us to holiness. And there's a reason why he called us to holiness. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 and 19. He says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that the man does is outside his body. This is a fascinating verse. Let me just encourage you guys and gals to think about this verse. Do a little digging, do a little study on this verse. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. I put the exclamation point there. I think that's a reference, if I understand it correctly, to consequences today in sinning in my own body in the area of sexual immorality whether that's a sickness that God places in my life, whether it's some type of judgment, I don't know, but I think it's for today. Then he asked the question, and I always stand rebuked whenever I read this verse and have for 50 years, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Why do I need to keep my life holy before before our God? It's because within me resides God's Holy Spirit. When he says temple, it's almost like you think of it as a house. He says, your body is the the house of the Holy Spirit. This is where the Holy Spirit of God resides. And because of that, I need to be careful. I've been bought with a price, God says. I'm supposed to be different because of that. Last verse of scripture, as I conclude this, it says, therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man. Our problem isn't with Paul. Our, our problem if, is if we disagree with this is not with, with the preacher. It's not with Pastor Kevin. Who's our problem with? God. He says because they're rejecting God. You say, well, Pastor Kevin, it's our culture. I understand. If you are guided by our culture, you are going to be going sideways fast. You and I are called to stand in opposition to our culture when it comes to areas of morality. That's what God has called us to do. If you want to be holy, if you want to be sanctified, if you want to be set apart to God, then this is an area that we must gain control over. My friends, listen, I believe Satan is absolutely having a field day in the church. If those statistics are even remotely close, and especially the ones that pertain to Christians, if they're remotely accurate, then we cannot be spirit-filled Christians while we have these sinful addictions. And so the church becomes powerless because we're unable to pray with power. We're unable to give the gospel with power. We're unable to walk in godliness and holiness if these areas of our life are out of whack. Don't deceive yourself into thinking this is no big deal because it is huge. It's huge. I talked to 
a couple young men who were at the pastor's conference back in January, Pure Life Ministries. They have a place out near Ohio, Kentucky. It's a little retreat area. And they deal with people who have sexual addictions. He was telling me of these people who fly across the world to come there. That's how far-reaching it is. He told me they had seven people from South Korea there that week. Sometimes they stay for a month. This is a huge problem. And this is among people who, notice that last verse there in your text. These are people who God has given his Holy Spirit. That's what it says there. We aren't powerless. But even while we have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within us, we can still struggle. You see, that temptation will always be there. But the people of God need to know how to possess their vessel with honor and sanctification. That is our challenge today, to have mastery over this area of our flesh. What God says is, you're going to have this desire, but the way to satisfy it I have already given to you. That, my friends, is the key. That's what these people in Thessalonica needed to hear. They needed to hear the significances of their marriage. They needed to understand how significant it was, how how not only did it keep them satisfied physically, but it also kept them away from, from the power of Satan. If you want a good read this afternoon, following this message up, read 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The Bible says that if a husband and wife Uh, take time away from each other, Uh, maybe because of anger, because of other issues, it invites satanic attack in their marriage. Whew. Our society is going downhill morally faster than I've ever seen a society go downhill. It's appalling. And we as Christians are going to stand out if we follow God's word. You realize just by by living a moral life, being different from the rest of the world, not going along with the same thing, it will set you aside. And you'll put those true life cards on your desk and people will know to come pick them up, even though they might not agree with you. Let's pray. In a moment, we're going to have a word of prayer. You may be here today, and it may be that God has spoken to your heart about placing your faith in Jesus. My friends, the only way we can have victory in our spiritual life is if we have come to Christ. Uh, Those in Thessalonica that were living after their passions of heart were not, as the Bible says, um, in a position where they could say that they know God. But my friends, the invitation goes out to all of us to place our faith in Jesus to know him who has created us, who has come to save us from our sin. If you're here today and you have questions that you would like answered, our care and concern team is here at the front and they'd be happy to help you. I trust that as we go from this place today, we will have victory in this area, that God will challenge our hearts, that we would be pure before him. Let's stand as we pray, shall we? God, how we give you thanks for the teaching of your word. And Lord, we know that there are many areas in our Christian life that we struggle with. There are situations, Father, that we find ourselves battling constantly. Help us, Father, to to truly meditate on this passage of Scripture. Help us to think it through and help us, Lord, to apply your wisdom to our lives. That we might live victoriously and be truly set apart to you. Honorable in all things. Help us, Father, to live in our own flesh in a way that brings honor to you and sets us apart for your glory. Give us a great week, I pray. Help us, Father, to to share the love of Christ. Help us, Father, to be different in a changing world, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.